Okay, so greetings and hello and welcome everyone in tonight's class. We will begin with the questions. We have two questions from English speakers and four questions from Chinese speakers. So we we'll begin with the first English question. The question was about that thing that we said that when in the seven limb prayers when we are requesting to turn the will of dharma we say that actually we do this together with a mandala offering so we put eight um, heaps of grain around the mandala and one at the center and we visualize that we have a thousand spoke wheel and together with that we visualize ourselves as brahma and make the request uh, to everyone in the field of merit to um, turn the will of Dharma. Okay, so the question was that, you know, I know Brahma uh, as a god uh, that belongs into Hinduism. So what are we doing here? You know, this is a Buddhist practice and is this okay? All right, so just to explain this, what we're doing here and the visualization that we do is actually going in accordance and reflecting the events that occurred during the, Buddha, the life of the Buddha. So our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, manifested enlightenment. And after that, he remained inactive. It means he didn't teach anything for seven weeks. After seven weeks, all the great deities of this world, such as Indra and Brahma, appeared with a thousand spoke wheel and requested the Buddha to teach. From amongst these two deities, it was Brahma who was the main one who made the request. And after that request, Buddha Shakyamuni agreed to teach and he gave, started teaching, gave the first teaching. So, one of the reasons why we do it, and it's not contradictory, is because we are reflecting, or if you could say we are reenacting, in a sense, the events that took place right after, after uh, Buddha Shakyamun's enlightenment, when that initial request was made. Another thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about Brahma as a god, actually there are many gods that are called Brahma, is not just one. So definitely we have a Brahma that uh, likes and protects and supports the virtue side. And then we have other God Brahma that actually opposes the virtue side. So again, if you think that, you know, this is the Brahma who supports virtue, and I visualize myself as this Brahma who supports virtue, there is no contradiction. Or again, you could even run with the third scenario and say, look, Brahma, who is the chief deity amongst Hindus, now is requesting Buddha Shakyamuni to give Buddhist teachings. That is actually very auspicious. Let's, let's go with this. But the main thing is, as we say, at the, time, at the time that this request was made to the actual Buddha Shakyamuni, Brahma was the most far, powerful deity. So when Brahma, who was the most powerful deity at that time, was requesting Buddha Shakyamuni with teachings, it goes without saying that everyone below Brahma as well and all the followers of Brahma were also requesting. So we are reenacting that event. Awesome. All right, so the second question uh, was a, a question that came about this uh, visualization that we do when we go for refuge and bodhicitta and then we have special bodhicitta. We have this visualization that I become Buddha Shakyamuni and from my heart rays of light radiate out and they purify all environments and all environments become pure fields and then they also purify all sentient beings and all sentient beings also become Buddhas and therefore you think I have already, I have placed all sentient beings in this state of bliss, in the state of Buddhahood. So we do this practice and the question was about this practice is saying when actually um, the, this, um, you know, impure samsaric environment and those pure fields 
they do not exist in actuality. Therefore, since nothing exists in actuality, therefore there is no pure land. And the person who was asking in this, uh, qu this question was actually quoting a verse from the Praise to Dependent Arising. The verse was saying, by declaring these chances for reification and denigration towards things seen and unseen are made most remote. And this quotation was given to support the statement that those things, that there is no actuality, those things do not actually exist. Okay, so Geshe-la is saying here that actually, exactly because things do not actually exist, exactly because things do not truly exist, it is for this reason that we do this meditation. If things actually existed, if things existed truly, if things existed inherently, we could do nothing about it. And our practice will be totally meaningless. We could not change them. However, because they do not actually exist, for that reason, it makes a lot of sense to practice. So Geshe was saying, I detect here that perhaps you have not made a very clear delineation between things, two things. There is one thing to say things exist and another thing to say things actually exist or things truly exist. And again, it's another thing to say nothing exists and that has a different meaning from saying nothing actually exists, nothing truly exists. If you don't make the differentiation between these two things, um, obviously those things do not make any sense. So we do make the distinction and we say because things do not truly exist, for that reason, the law of cause and effect operates. It means we will have results if we do certain actions. And this is exactly what we're doing with our practice. So it is very meaningful for us to go through this practice of imagining that we purify the impure and we make it completely pure. For us beginners, it is a very beneficial practice because it places imprints so that in the future, we will have the capacity to do that. So Geshe was saying, it is, this it is like this example. Let's say you have a stomach ache and you have a medicine, right? That can be beneficial, that, that is prescribed for this condition that you have. Because the stomach ache does not actually exist, does not truly exist, for that reason, if you take the medicine, you will improve. The medicine works the medicine removes your stomach ache because the stomach ache does not actually, does not truly exist. It exists, but it does not truly, does not actually exist. Because things do not truly exist, for that reason, we can bring about change. We can change things. So Geshe was saying, it's very good if you look at the works of Lama Tsongkhapa in the middle way, such as, uh, the differentiation between the definitive and the ultimate meaning or elucidation, the clear presentation of the intention and so forth. He clearly differentiates between existing and truly existing. Yeah. As for the verse... Well, as for the verse that you have actually brought up in your question, the meaning of this verse is that Buddha Shakyamuni has taught dependent origination and no one can actually find an opportunity to criticize the Buddha for this presentation of dependent origination and offer a proper, a logical criticism. If you approach it in a logical way, you cannot find fault in the presentation of dependent origination that the Buddha gave. This is the meaning of this verse. In this verse, it says, um, you, by declaring these chances for reification and denigration 
towards things seen and unseen are made are made most remote. Most remote is means you don't have a chance. You have the you don't have the opportunity to offer any constructive criticism for. Uh, the presentation of dependent origination. So whether you are someone who is a non-Buddhist or whether you are someone who is coming from the lower Buddhist schools and is trying to find fault in this presentation, you cannot find it because dependent origination is the one argument, the one presentation that simultaneously takes care and removes both faults. One is the fault of reification uh, superimposition and the other one is the fault of denigration of uh, you know re refuting or denying too much so you cannot find the opportunity to criticize logically uh, dependent origination that's the meaning of the verse <laughs> okay so Gesha is saying I'm very pleased with your question this is a really very nice question and you have to understand that, of course, you know, within uh, Tibetan Buddhism, we have the four main traditions. And here Geshe says, I am trained in the Geluk tradition, and I have studied the works of Jerem Bote, of Lama Tsongkhapa. And this is how I'm presenting this from this particular avenue. Of course, there are debates between because there are slightly different interpretations of those things amongst the four different schools so you might hear another explanation from someone else who represents another tradition however following here the presentation of Lama Tsongkhapa Lama Tsongkhapa in his works he took a great care and he went into great length in order to make this distinction between existing and existing from its own side not existing and not existing from its own side. These things are different. Many great scholars prior to Lama Tsongkhapa were not able to make that differentiation. And by not making this differentiation, actually they were rejecting conventional existence. They would say that everything you see around you is just an illusion, nothing con conventionally nothing exists because nothing exists from its own side they were saying nothing exists however these two things are not the same these two things are different in this tradition this is how we present it so Geshe was saying i offer this explanation today it was a very good question if you want to take this home and think more about it you want to come back with a new question that would be excellent we can you're allowed to ask more questions hopefully we can clarify it even more okay all right so we start now with the first of the chinese questions in um, on page three of your translation after we have visualized the syllables um, um, and so forth uh, then light from the syllable whom at the heart of the Guru Buddha is radiated in the ten directions. This invites the wisdom beings from their natural abodes. Actually, there are a few words missing in the translation. It says invites the wisdom beings similar to the ones meditated upon uh, from their natural abodes. So the question is, what are those wisdom beings that we are inviting uh, what's the difference between the wisdom and the commitment beings? Why are they are uh, we inviting the same, looking the same, and continuing saying, you know, I do not have a photograph of the field of accumulation, and the question was like, how can I visualize it? All right. So first of all, let's clarify those terms. We talk about the commitment beings. The commitment beings are the visualization that you create in front of you. So whatever you visualize in your mind, and in this case, you place it in the space in front of you, this is called the commitment beings. And then we say that we invite the wisdom beings. The wisdom beings are the actual deities. So you have visualized all those deities, but in reality, all those deities exist. So the real ones are called the wisdom beings. Okay? So we have the ones that we visualize 
they're called the commitment beings. And in reality, the commitment beings are the basis in which the wisdom beings will come and dissolve. And then we have the wisdom beings that are the real ones. We invite them to come and dissolve into the ones that we have visualized. So in reality, we do not really need to go through this extra step of specifically inviting them, but we do it in order to overcome our doubt. Because here we are visualizing this whole field of accumulation, but at the back of your mind, you'll be thinking, okay, I'm visualizing this, but is anything happening? Is anyone here? Is this going to be of any benefit? So to overcome this doubt, we go through the extra step of inviting the real deities to say, come here and dissolve within the ones I have visualized. And that puts our mind at ease. Now we say, okay, I have visualized them, I have invited them, they're here, they have merged, they have become one. So this process of inviting them and having the same aspect is to clear away our doubt, are they here or not? And also to reinforce our faith, to reinforce the visualization, just to reinforce um, the practice. Okay, so uh, now the question, I don't have a picture and how can I visualize it? So Geshela was actually showing the picture. So I have a picture myself at the very center we have the main deity, which is uh, uh, Guru Shakyamuni, isn't it? To the right, to the right, okay? Um, we have Protector Matriya and all the lineage of extensive deeds. To the left, we have Protector Manjushri and all the lineage of the profound wisdom, profound view. In front of the main deity, Okay, sorry. In front, we have the actual gurus. And then we begin with the deities. The first row is going to be the deities of the highest yoga tantra. And then below that, we will have yoga tantra. Then below that, we will have performance tantra. And below that, we will have action tantra. Then we have the row of the Buddhas, the thousand Buddhas of this eon, the 35 Buddhas, the eight medicine Buddhas, and so forth. Then we have the Bodhisattvas, then hearers, solitary realizers, dakas, dakinis, and protectors. So you can find an image and uh, you can visualize it. This is, you know, this is the basic representation. Hi, translators. Is it possible to translate what Gishla has mentioned? Just the first half. Yeah, first half. Okay. So what uh, Geshe was saying is that there are actually two variations in terms of the deities here. And um, Geshe presented it by saying we have one role with the deities of Chai's Yoga Tantra, and then after that you have Yoga Tantra, after that... So, okay, so we have variations in this presentation of how we place the deities of the different classes of Tantra. One way, which was the first way that it was presented, is you have them in rows. The first row will be Highest Yoga Tantra, so you see all the Highest Yoga Tantra. After that, you will see Yoga Tantra, after that, Performance Tantra, after that, Yoga um, Action Tantra. But Geshela had a closer look at his own picture. And he saw that he had the second version. In the second version, instead of having separate rows, you put them around the main figure. So we put the deities of highest yoga tantra at the front. And if you put them in this way, the only ones that you will see is deities of highest yoga tantra. And then to the right of the main deity, you will have yoga tantra behind him you will put performance tantra and then to his left you will put action tantra so if you're looking if you're looking at it from the front all you would see is the deities of highest yoga tantra because the other ones they go around the main deity okay so we have these two variations 
Um, so have a good look at your, if you have a picture, have a good look at the picture and you will identify the differences. So it's enough to just have a general idea where the main groups are. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So again, guess what I was saying is that we're having some problems with the quality of the line. It keeps cutting off. Uh, but I think we got enough information. So uh, finishing off from the, from the last question, the person was saying that they have not been able to find a photograph of the field of accumulation. And Gesha was saying, if actually, if you look around, it's not rare. It's quite easy to find. So please go around and ask, and I'm sure you will receive one. Okay. Now, the next question, it was a question about going for refuge. So once we go for refuge, we visualize the objects of refuge and then we recite this and we say go for refuge to the guru many times so what is the visualization we should be doing at that time and then we say go for refuge to the buddha then i go for refuge to the dharma I go for refuge to the sangha what is the specific visualization and what are we thinking as we're doing this recitation so first of all um, about the two fields we have the objects of refuge and we have the field of accumulation these two are very very similar so if you have one basically you have the other so when we do the first one, we say, I go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the guru. So at that point, we do a visualization where we see the descent of nectar and light that is coming out of the five groups of gurus. So what are the five groups of gurus? We said that in front of the main figure, we have the group of gurus direct and indirect gurus from whom you have received teachings in this life. But then we have other gurus. So to the right, we have all the gurus of the lineage of extensive deeds. To the left, we have all the gurus of the lineage of profound view. To the back, we have all the gurus from the lineage of the blessed practice. So these are the five groups of gurus. And as we say, I go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the guru, we visualize that from the, their bodies, all of those bodies, there is nectar and light that comes and descends within us. It comes and enters our mind stream and our body and mind stream. And with this, we imagine that we purify all negativity and obscurations we have created in relation to the guru. And that at the same time, we receive also all the great qualities of their body, speech, and mind, and that all those things increase within our own um, mind stream. Okay, then with the next one, when we say I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Buddha. So we said that we have right under the direct gurus, we have the deities. And whichever arrangement you have, you will have the deities of the four classes of Tantra. So these are the Buddhas from the Tantric point of view. And then below them, you have the Buddhas from the Sutric point of view, which are the Buddhas of the, the thousand Buddhas of the Sion, the 35 Buddhas and so forth. So when you say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, you imagine now the nectars and the rays of light coming out from the bodies of the deities and the Buddhas. Okay, so again, you purify negativity and you receive all the qualities. Then you say, I go for refuge to the Dharma, I go for refuge to the Dharma, I go for refuge to the Dharma. So you, we say that in front of all the lamas and all the deities, you will find a small table. And on top of that table, you will have a volume of the text, which is the particular Dharma or the particular teachings that this Buddha or this Lama has given. So now we visualize that the nectar is coming out of those texts. And these texts obviously have the aspect externally of texts internally. They are all the qualities of the realization uh, that they have. So the truth of cessation and the truth of the path, all these realizations come within us. Then we go for refuge to the Sangha, and now we visualize nectar coming from the Sangha. So who is the Sangha? We have Bodhisattvas, hearers, solitary realizers, Dakas, Dakinis, and protectors of the Dharma. So 
comes from them. So, okay, sorry, if it, if it is unclear due to the internet interrupt, interruptions, please ask again and we'll try to clarify further. Okay, so we continue with the next uh, question. The next question is uh, quite similar to the first one because we come to the point where we say that rays of light emanate from the syllable HUM at the heart of Guru Buddha and it invites the wisdom beings from the natural abode and those wisdom beings, they have similar aspect with the ones that are meditated. So the question is, why? what is the similar aspect and why do they have to be in similar aspect? And um, yesterday we're saying that we do this because we have established a visualization. And after you have visualized something, you invite the wisdom beings. The wisdom beings are the real deities, right? And you invite them to come and merge with the ones that you have visualized. And obviously, you want them to be corresponding in aspect. So, for example, you visualize the main, the main figure, Guru, um, Guru Shakyamuni, and he has a particular posture. Uh, the hands in a, are in a particular position. He has this and that feature. So, the one that you invite in the real um, Guru Buddha Shakyamuni has this specific aspect. So it comes exactly in that aspect that you have visualized it. All right. Um, and then the very last question was that in the main figure and all the surrounding figures in five places of the body, we place five syllables. So we have uh, one syllable at the crown, um, then we have uh, a syllable at the uh, at the um, mouth, then we have at the heart, then we have at the navel, and then we have at the sacred place. And the question was, do, is it okay to visualize those syllables in Chinese letters, or do we have to visualize the syllables or mahom, spaha, in Tibetan letters? And Geshe was saying, I haven't actually seen any specific, uh, let's say, mention about this in, in the text, but using my logic, I would say that you can visualize it in Chinese because initially we got them, we Tibetans, we got it from Sanskrit and initially we're writing in Sanskrit, but now we're writing it in our language, in Tibetan. So I think if you follow the same reason, you can write it in Chinese. You can visualize it in Chinese. Okay, so if uh, we have finished now with the questions and we start with uh, going back into our text. In our text is, we have uh, how to practice Guru devotion, the root of the path, and then how to train one's mind after you have generated devotion. So for the first, how to practice Guru devotion, we have two subdivisions, how to practice during the formal meditation session and how to practice during the interval, intervals between sessions. In terms of how to practice during the actual meditation session, we have three parts. We have the preparation, the actual practice, and the conclusion. In the preparation, we have the six preparatory practices. From those, we have so far covered the first five. So clean the room and uh, arrange representations of body, speech, and mind, the first one. The second one, arrange beautifully offerings you have obtained honestly. The third one, sit in the Varachana posture, go for refuge and generate bodhicitta. The fourth one, visualize the field of accumulation. The fifth one, make the seven limb prayers and the mandala. And now we come to the sixth one, which is making petitions to the field of accumulation. So if we go to our text, we are at the bottom of page three, uh, where it says, after offering the seven limb prayers and the mandala makes applications and as, um, sorry, and as it is explained in the instruction, make sure that your mind is infused with them. So we have different, uh, four different types of supplications that we will be doing. 
Okay, so we say here that we begin with the petitions and the first thing to establish is that we have a basis or a foundation with which we make the petition. And uh, this uh, happens as we make a mandala offering. Gesha is saying there's quite a lot to say about the mandala offering, exactly how to do it, the tradition, what is what it represents and so forth. But uh, um, Gesha will not explain this today. If you are interested, you can pursue this. You can ask more questions or approach other people as well. You can find details about how to make the mandala offering so in uh, um, it is um, you can you can make different types of mandala there is extensive and there is condensed uh, you can use the sashi poki which is the short mandala offering also keep in mind that we have the external the internal the secret and the mandala of thusness so there are different types of offerings you can do so once you have arranged the heaps of whatever material you are piling up in the basis of the mandala, you hold it with both of your hands and you present it as an offering. You present it because you're going to be making requests. And imagine if you found yourself in a position where you have to, re to make an important request to an official, right? You never go empty handed. You always go there with a the present. So you offer the present, and after you offer the present, you make your request. So this, what, what, this is how it happens here as well. First, you make the mandala offering, you present the mandala, and then you make the request. Okay, now in terms of the request, it is said that we are requesting for the three great purposes. The first purpose that we are requesting for is to remove from our mind any misconceptions and any mistakes we have made along the path from the very beginning from incorrectly relying upon the spiritual teacher all the way up to incorrectly understanding the state of union of a non-learner. Okay, so this is one, the first great purpose, remove all my... Um, mistakes, misunderstandings. The second great purpose is that we request all the correct realizations for the entire path. Correct realization beginning from the proper way to rely on the spiritual teacher all the way up to obtaining the state of non-learners union. And the third great uh, purpose we're requesting is that all obstacles, external and internal, be removed. It says that there are no purposes that are greater than those three. Remove my misconceptions, allow me to generate correct realizations, and remove all obstacles, inner and outer. So what we're doing here, we are offering petition. Uh, the word for petition in Tibetan is a two-syllable word. So it is uh, sowa deb, sol and deb. The first one, sol, means to make a requ re means request. And the deb, the second syllable, means to offer. So you're offering a request, you're making a request. So it's a petition. So what is it that you are requesting? We are requesting and say, please bless my mind stream. Again, let's look at this word bless. Uh, blessing, I mean, in English, if we look at the Tibetan that comes from the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit term for that is Aditrana. Aditrana is two syllables. Adi uh, refers to activities, enlightened activities. And trana means change. Okay, so what are we saying? We are, Actually, we are requesting that something changes. So we say, my continuum up to now has been under the influence of afflictions. So I want you to change all those previous instances of my mind stream of inappropriate behavior that came through afflictions. I want you to change it through your enlightened activities, so through your power by relying on your power, may I be able to change my attitude? By relying on you, may I be able to change my activities? So basically, this is what we are saying. When you say, I want your blessing, 
we say, I want to change all this, all the previous nastiness within my mind stream by relying on you. I want to change it. So we're requesting, please bless my mind stream. Okay, so we now come to the second uh, uh, stage of the petition. And in this one, we, it is called the petition of the root guru as a representative. So remember that in the visualization in front of you, in the merit field, you have the main figure, uh, which is Guru Shakyamuni. And then right in front of him, you have your direct and lineage gurus. So now to do this, uh, th this part of the practice, you visualize that a replica of your root guru separates from the merit field in front and comes to the crown of your head. He actually comes and sits here and he turns and faces the same way that you are facing. So he's also facing the merit field. So... Um, he is actually going to represent you. You want to make a request to the merit field and your, uh, your root guru is going to make this request on your behalf. So just as when you are going to address someone very important and you have a very important request to make, sometimes you don't speak directly, but you have someone who is representing you, right? A friend or someone who has a greater power than you, but is definitely on your side. And that person is going to make the request on your behalf. So both of you go and make the request. So this is what you're doing. You're bringing the root guru, a replica of the root guru, to come and sit at the crown of your, head, of your head. And this guru is going to make the request. You make the request as well, but the guru is making the request along with you. So before he makes the request, you recite a verse who says, my precious, and, uh, my precious and rude guru, please come and take your seat at the crown of my head and bestow on me all cities of your body, speech and mind. Recite this three times and then imagine that he dissolves um, into you and you receive all of his blessings. Once this has happened, then you can go ahead with the request. So now he becomes your representative and he will make the request to the merit field. As you are requesting, he will be your representative. Okay, so we have this verse that we recite. My precious uh, root guru, please come and take uh, your seat at the crown of my head and bestow me all cities of your body, speech and mind. So in, initially when we recite this, we visualize that um, rays of light and nectar descend from the body of the guru and they purify all our negativities and all our or obscurations and that we receive the blessings to generate the realizations of the entire path within our own mind stream and with this we visualize that our body becomes completely clean and luminous and clear and radiates light then with the second repetition we visualize that a replica of the root guru not just nectar a replica comes and dissolves within us and in this way we receive the blessings uh, then we begin with the actual request to the merit the, the main figure of the merit um, field where now we are requesting the Guru Buddha Shakyamuni and we say you know we re recite the verse that says please bless me and um, we recite it again twice the first time we will receive purifying nectars and we will remove our negativities and our obscurations and with the second repetition again following the same formula we will see a replica separating a replica of buddha shakyamuni now separating and coming and dissolving within us and within and in this way uh, we receive all the blessings Okay, so after that, after the petition of the, to the root guru and the petition to Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, then we are requesting all the, all the figures of the lineage of the extensive deeds. So we begin by saying Matria, the invisible, the victor's holy regent, 
all the way up to the point where it says Dipankara Tisha, who held the forerunner's tradition, Rumtopa, who made the clear and noble path, and made petition to the three backbones of the teachings. So we recited twice. So now we are petitioning the lineage of the extensive deeds. And as before, in the first case, we imagine that uh, purifying nectars so from all of them come and descend and remove our negativities. And with the second repetition, we imagine that we receive replicas from each one of the lamas of the extensive deed. They come and dissolve into us. Next, we continue with making a petition to the lineage of the profound view. So we recite the verse that says, Manjushri, who embodies all omniscience of the victors, Nagarjuna, most excellent Arya, to see profound meaning. I make request to the three crest jewels of philosophers and so forth. So now we're requesting all the main figures of the lineage of the profound view. With the first recitation, we visualize purifying nectars coming from all of them and they remove all negativities and obscurations we have created. In particular, all negativities in relation to the lineage of the profound view. And then with the second repetition, we receive replicas of all these lamas and we think that now we, this becomes the condition for us to develop the realizations of the profound view within our mind stream. Uh, then following that, we make the request uh, to the fifth group of lamas, which is the lamas of the blessed practice. So we begin with a verse that says to the master Vajradhara and so forth, and we mention all the main figures of the blessed practice. We please bless me. It's, it's always a request to receive blessings. So again, with the first recitation, we receive purifying nectars from them to remove all ob obstacles, negativities, obscurity we have created in relation to generating the realizations of uh, this particular lineage and with the second recitation we visualize that we have replicas of all these main lamas they come and dissolve within us and in this way we generate within our mind stream all these realizations so once we have completed petitions to the five groups of the lamas, then we continue with petitioning the yidams, then after that we petition the buddhas, the bodhisattvas, the hearers, solitary realizers, dakas, dakinis, and the various protectors. So again, it's a similar pattern. We're reciting twice, we're making the petition twice. The first time we remove negativities, the second time we receive replicas and we generate the realizations. So this is the particular way of making petitions according to Lama Tsongkhapa. This is the tradition that is considered to be very precious and very important. Okay, then uh, we continue with the next uh, request for blessings that we have. And um, some say that here when we are doing the preliminaries, we mentioned that we have the six preliminary rites, right? At the end of that, uh, there is a tradition of doing a quick meditation on all the subjects of the Lamrim by reciting the, t the short text that is the foundation of all good qualities. So by doing this, the foundation of all good qualities, basically you are reviewing the whole Lamrim path and this is also requesting like the blessings of all those stages of the path in a condensed way. So they say that you can do this as part of the preliminaries, but if you're doing the actual practice, if you are in the actual part, not on the preliminaries, but the actual practice, it is not necessary to do the recitation of the foundation of all good qualities, right? So it is um, a, a recitation of these texts that is appended to the six preliminary practices. So in this particular way where we are requesting for blessings by reciting the foundation of the for, of the foundation of all qualities, it is called um, requesting 
the blessings as a group. So instead of uh, going and doing a, an individual request to each group or making an individual request for each specific, each specific blessing that you want, you can just gather them all together and you say just all the blessings, just download all the blessings down to me. So it's a request, a, uh, let's say a heaped, you're, they're all heaped together a group together, a grouped request of blessings. Okay, so following after that, we have to perform a consolidation of the merit field, so of the field of accumulation. So from our translation, I have sent a correction because there's a sentence missing where it says, rays of light radiate from the uh, syllable whom at the heart of, of Guru Shakyamuni. They strike the myriad peaceful and wrathful beings in the 10 directions. So here he's talking about all the deities that, you know, the, the different lineages and the deities and so forth that are arranged around the central deity, Guru Shakyamuni. So rays of light go out from Guru Shakyamuni, they strike all these deities, and they gather in the aspect of light and dissolve into Buddha Shakyamuni. So they, all these secondary deities, they will have to come and dissolve into the main deity. So it is a gradual dissolution. If we look again at the field of accumulation, we will start from the bottom row and start gathering upwards towards the central figure. So at the bottom, we have the Dharma protectors. They will dissolve into the row right above them, which is uh, Dakas and Akinis. They will dissolve into um, Pratyeka Buddhas. They will dissolve into hearers. They will dissolve into Bodhisattvas. They will dissolve into Buddhas. Now, these are the, tantric, the Sutric Buddhas. Now, the Sutric Buddhas are going to dissolve into the Tantric deities. If you have the version where the four classes of Tantra are one after the other, the uh, Sutric Buddhas will dissolve into the deities of Action Tantra. They will dissolve into the deities of performance tantra, they will dissolve into the deities of the yoga tantra, they will dissolve into the deities of high yoga tantra. If you have the four classes of tantra arranged around, then the, from the right, the left and behind, they will come and dissolve into the deities of high yoga tantra. And then these deities of high yoga tantra will dissolve into the lineage gurus and the lineage gurus will dissolve into your root guru then we will have all the deities of the extensive deed or the the figures of the extensive deed they will dissolve into materia all the ones from the profound view they will dissolve into manjushri materia and manjushri will dissolve into the main deity then from the blessed practice, everything will dissolve into Buddha Vajradhara and then Buddha Vajradhara will dissolve into the main figure. So this is how all of it dissolves into the center. Able to translate or not enough to translate? Can you translate? Yeah. No, it's it's enough. enough. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have now consolidated all those figures, that elaborate visualization, and we are just left with the main figure, Guru Shakyamuni. And remember that initially we have requested a replica from the root guru to come to the crown of our head to be our representative. So now we just have Guru Shakyamuni in front and we have our own guru on our head. So now this Guru Shakyamuni comes and dissolves into the guru that we have in our head. So it says here, um, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni in turn merges into the root guru who abides at the top of your head. Due to this, the root guru transforms into the one whose essence is our kind and root guru and who appears in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. All right, so just, we were just left with two figures. So one figure in front has now come and dissolved into the figure that is Guru Shakyamuni. They have become one. So he seated upon a variegated lotus, moon, and sun disc seats. 
and from that point you mentally review the visualization of the merit field as described above until he's sitting in the cross-legged position in a halo of bright light coming from his body. So once you have done this final part, quickly you offer the seven limb prayer to your guru now that encompasses all objects of refuge. So you're making prostrations, offerings, confession, you're rejoicing, you are requesting the teachings, you are asking not to pass into Paranirvana and you make a dedication. And after that, you make a mandala offering. And once you have done all this, then you're ready to make the supplications. So um, we are at the point where we have uh, brought the main figure, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, to come and dissolve into the guru that we have at the crown of our head. So now the guru in the, at the crown of our head has the aspect of Guru Shakyamuni. And this Guru Shakyamuni here, the soul figure that is there, is encompassing or it's representing, it's embodying all objects of refuge. So it represents since all the gurus, all the yidams, and the three jewels, um, the three objects of refuge. Now, um, from this point onwards, we make a very strong request, and we consider that until now, my mind stream has been under the influence of very strong afflictions. And due to that, it has been very, it is very hard for me to generate any realizations when I study or when I meditate. However, the Buddha has said that if I make petitions to the Guru, these realizations, I receive the blessings and the realizations will come. The advice of Buddha Shakyamuni is infallible. He will never lie to us and therefore I will follow this advice. So now I'm going to address uh, all my requests to this Guru, understanding that I place all my hopes he represents every object of refuge. There is no other refuge other than him. So I place all my attention and all my hopes to him and him alone. So this is said, this is said to be making a request uh, similar to driving a stake on the, in, the, in the ground, like single-pointedly uh, very intense request. Uh, so this is how we have come to the point to explain the different stages of making, preparing to make the petitions and requests. So in this, with this understanding, we will be reciting those petitioning verses again and again. And uh, this um, explains what we have done today. We have explained how we go through the different stages, the visualizations to prepare ourselves to make these uh, requests. In order, to, and from here onwards, we will be ready to begin meditation on to properly how to properly rely on the teacher. Okay, so if you can follow your text, the root text of the easy path, we are at the bottom of page three. We're just going to cover quickly the text, you know, the parts that we covered. Uh, so it says, after offering the seven limb prayer in the mandala, makes applications and as in the instructions, make sure your mind is infused with them. So up to this point, we are still dealing with the preliminaries and we're coming to the sixth preliminary. Then it says, rays of light radiate from the syllable home at the heart of, Buddha, of Guru Shakyamuni. They strike the myriad peaceful and wrathful beings in the 10 directions. They gather in the aspect of light and dissolve into Buddha Shakyamuni, the main figure, and this in turn merges into root guru who abides on the top of your head. Due to this, the root guru transforms into the one whose essence is your kind root lama and who appears in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. He is seated in the variegated lotus moon and sun disk, mentally review the visualization of the merit field as described above from the point until he is sitting in the cross-legged position in a halo of bright light coming from his body. So as you can see here, this describes this process of consolidating the entire merit field. 
uh, field of accumulation uh, and then bringing Buddha Shakyamuni to come and dissolve into the Kuru at the crown of the head. So now this becomes the one and only figure in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. Then it says, after having offered briefly the seven limb prayers and the mandala, imagine that yourself together with all mother sentient beings who are all around you in a single voice are making supplications with the following words. So now all of us, myself, surrounded by all sentient beings who are going to make supplications and the supplications are going to be addressing this guru as being the embodiment of all objects of refuge. So it says, I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, embodiment of the four Kayas. So the four Kayas here refers to the four bodies of the Buddha, the nature body, the pristine wisdom body, the enjoyment body, and the emanation body. So it says, I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, embodiment of the Dharmakaya, the truth body, which is free from obscurations. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, embodiment of the Sambhogagaya, the enjoyment body of great bliss. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, embodiment of the Nirmanakaya, emanation body of manifold forms. So as you see here, we are addressing him uh, as uh, being each one of the four bodies. So we have to look at the Guru as being the four kayas, the four bodies. I make a request to you, uh, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Gurus. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Yidams. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Buddhas. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the sublime Dharma. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Sangha. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Dakas and Akinis. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the Dharma protectors. In particular, beseech him with the following words. I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all the objects of refuge. So as you see here, we are addressing him as being the embodiment of the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, of all objects of refuge. Okay, so remember the instructions that the Venerable Manjushri gave to Lama Tsongkhapa. He said there are three things that are very important. You have to build up your accumulation and work on your personal purification. That's number one. Number two, you have to make a request viewing the Guru as inseparable from the Yidam. And number three, you have to do the to cultivate the actual focal objects uh, of the meditation because they become the substantial cause for generating the realization. So from those three important steps with the six preliminaries, we have covered the first two. By offering, we go through the seven limb prayer, right? Uh, part of the preliminaries. So definitely we address this issue of building up the accumulation of merit and uh, working on our purification. And also, as you see, with the last of the preliminaries, which is making the petition, we are addressing this issue where it says you have to make petitions and you have to pray to your guru, seeing him inseparable from the deity. So from the three points, two of them have been covered with these stages of the preliminaries. And what comes after that is what it says here, the substantial cause for generating realization. The substantial cause for generating realization is cultivating meditation or concentration on the, very, on the specific focal objects. So this is something that we do now in the actual part of the session. So that means that if you meditate on the first subject, which is the proper way to rely on the teacher, there are certain focal objects that you have to meditate upon. So first we do the preliminaries, and then in the actual session, we have to do this 
meditation. Then when we move into the next meditation subject, which will be death and impermanence, and then the one after this uh, that is going to be refuge, then after this we're going to have the law of cause and effect. Each one of those will be a specific meditation with its own subjects or objects that we need to meditate upon. But what we need to remember is that, that these preliminaries have to be applied in each one of those meditation sessions. They are presented here uh, at great length with the first meditation session, which is how to properly rely on the teacher. But that doesn't, and then they, they don't appear in the other meditations. But that doesn't mean that you only meditate on those things in the first subject, how to rely on the teacher. And then when you go to the second subject, you completely forget about those preliminaries. They are very important things. And we have to apply all of those preliminaries in each one of the meditation sessions that we do. All right. So... And Geshe was saying here that from, uh, we come to the conclusion of this presentation of the preliminaries. It was a little bit short. It was not as detailed or as, as extens extensive as it could be. A special section such as making prostrations, making offerings, making the mandala offerings. Geshe said, I didn't really elaborate on this. If you are interested in those things, please follow up with questions. And also we have run out of time, so we're not gonna have questions tonight, but please forward your questions to the translators and we will have the questions next session. We will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, how now woman We'll do dedication of Marie. Oh, yeah. 